so uh, there, there, there are various uh, notes, that, uh, a new set of notes for today, and some copies of the notes for the first two weeks. Uh, general warning in all of, all of these sets of notes, there are various errors, mostly small ones. So for example, uh, so this is this is more or less the first page of today's notes, which are a review of some of the material from the first two weeks. So for example, this superscript is wrong in the notes, it should be handed at one. And this is just entirely missing from the notes. Uh, started writing the sentence and then finish it. Uh, there's some other, there's some other uh, small errors in the, uh, in the other notes. Uh, so, uh, so the, the, this is this is uh, uh, this is kind of a reminder of why why we're doing uh, what we're going to be doing. This lecture and the next two lectures, which is discussing uh, various various limits um, uh, limits of distributions of random variables which arise in a certain way from system mechanics models. Uh, today will be from easing models, which are these things, where the basic variables take values plus one and plus one and minus one, uh, and uh, under the right conditions, which we will have in our, our examples, uh, the, uh, the limiting distributions that you get will have the pure imaginary zeros property, namely that the moment generating function or double sided Laplace transform of the probability measure as a entire function of the complex variable z has only pure imaginary zeros. And that's, an interest, that's interesting because that's exactly the property that you want for a very particular probability density, namely this one on the real line. Uh, you want that because that, that probability density satisfying that property is exactly equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis that's this thing. Um, so a possible strategy uh, nobody knows if it's a good strategy until it works or it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Well, it doesn't work unless it works. Uh, uh, it would be to find a, a sequence of, of these kinds of models, either using models. Another one we mentioned uh, last time is an XY model. XY models are ones that are sort of similar to this, except the basic variables are vector value. Instead of real value, you're taking values on the unit circle, uh, and then you look at some similar, some similar uh, variable built out of those. Namely, you look at the first uh, average uh, linear combination with positive coefficients of the first coordinate, and that also has this this pure imaginary zeros property. So you could also consider a sequence of these x y type models, which we will do next week. So, so far, uh, in the first seminar, we've talked about a few examples where you know something, either can, in simplest cases, can actually calculate the limiting distribution. Uh, just, to, just to get started, uh, there are two cases. Today, we're going to do a different case, uh, which begins to get a little more interesting. The, the simplest case is one uh, using, using this type of model, but there are all these coefficients are zero, these capital J's. When they're zero, then the joint distribution is just a product measure. It means the basic variables are independent variables taking the values plus one and minus one, probably one half for each. That's a classic example of uh, independent random variables. And then you can look at this kind of quantity where you take all these coefficients to be the same, and if you take them to be one over the square root of n, then you're adding up n independent identical distributed random variables because of the symmetry. They have zero mean. They also have 
uh, second moment are variance equal to one. So that's the most special case of the classical central limit theorem. And then that sequence of random variables converges in distribution to the uh, standard normal distribution, which has this density. Uh, so that, that's the kind of undergraduate level uh, example. And then we also talked about a, 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 a still very relatively simple, but a little more interesting than this one, where these coefficients are not zero, but they're all the same for all little i and little j. And in order to get an interesting limit, you should take those coefficients and be basically proportional to a constant over n. Or it could be a little more general than that. You could have this, uh, this uh, constant depending on the n, so it's not quite a constant, but it ought to converge to some value. And uh, it, when it does that, or when it simply equals that value, then uh, this model is uh, an old model of slow mechanics, and it's known to have a uh, transition when you vary the parameter beta from below the value 1, which is called the critical value, to above the value 1, and it's below the value 1, it behaves pretty much like the case of beta equals 0, which is this case. This case is classical probability in the, uh, independent random variables. When beta is small, or small enough, but not 0, they're not independent, but they're kind of asymptotically independent, and they behave very similarly. You have the law of large numbers behavior, that is, if you add up the variables divided by n, in the limit you get a constant. Constant in this case is 0. Um, if, you, if you divide by square root of n, then you get a normal distribution, like here. But on the other hand, if beta is bigger than this critical value, then even the law of large numbers breaks down. That means if you add up the n variables divided by n, you don't get a constant limit. You get a non-degenerate distribution. The most interesting case is if beta equals 1 or approaches 1. Uh, the previous time, uh, we just mentioned this in the first sem seminar. Uh, we just took uh, that case where we just took it equal to 1. But you can also make it approach 1. And if you make it approach 1, which is the critical value, you have to do it in the right <coughs> way to get an interesting limit. If, if it's simply equal to 1, then what we mentioned the previous time was the limiting density rather than this uh, normal Gaussian form has an e to the minus w to the fourth power form. And if you have this, this modification, then that's sort of perturbed by a kind of Gaussian looking factor. That can all be done very explicitly uh, by fairly simple calculations, which if I were giving 10 lectures instead of five, I would do that in one of them. But, uh, but uh, we're going to go on to a different example uh, which is uh, uh, actually more interesting than, than this one, uh, especially because it leads to uh, a similar thing in the next lecture, uh, in which the easing model is replaced by the XY model, and that leads to some interesting questions which we'll talk about in the final lecture. Okay, so 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 the only thing to remember from this is that uh, in already in this rather simple case. Uh, you see that to get an interesting limit, uh, if, uh, if in a model with a critical uh, parameter, you should somehow take your, your parameter as n goes to infinity to approach the critical parameter and should approach it in the right way. You'll we'll see that also in the uh, situation we talked about today. Okay. Uh, Now we're on page two of today's notes. So, um, so this was a trivial example in which all these uh, coefficients or couplings were zero, exactly zero. This they weren't zero, but there was no dependence on i and j. Now we'll do an example where there is dependence on i and j. So that, that's much more interesting. And uh, this example is. It was re it's regarded in the physics uh, setting as a also pretty trivial example, uh, and just like just like in any case, it will be related to some very classical probability theory, just the theory of Markov chains. Uh, 
through simple one. So this let you miss it. The terminology used in the physics literature is that this is a nearest neighbor one dimensional uh, easy model. So, uh, uh, perfectly unlike the two dimensional easy model, where you replace, which we also mentioned in the first talk, where you replace or you choose these indices i and j to be points in a two-dimensional lattice of integer points in the plane. But here, it's a one-dimensional lattice. So in fact, it's perfectly fine to just take them to be the integers 1 to n, so we don't have to change that. So here is the, here is what we take for these coefficients. Uh, there is a parameter, just like in the Curie-Rice model, and you, you can let that depend upon n. In fact, you have to to get an interesting number in this case. Uh, and there is, there is ij dependence. Uh, they're not all the same. Uh, and the dependence is that this is 0, except when i and j are neighboring integers. So it's 1 if i and j are neighboring integers. That's why it's called near, uh, uh, this. Sorry, this. <laughs> That's abbreviation for nearest neighbor. The nearest, the nearest neighbor of the integer is the, is the integer which is one less or one more. And the integer points to plane, there would be four neighbors above, below, to the right, and the left. Uh, it is zero otherwise. Okay, so so we are so what we're going to do is basically uh, the analog for this still pretty simple model uh, of what we <coughs> talked about uh, for the Curie Weiss case. Uh, there's, there's some obvious I believe some obvious differences, but that's roughly what we're doing. Uh, something that. Uh, and uh, you'll, you'll, I think you'll see why uh, is a useful way of organizing things here uh, is to, uh, rather than just look at sort of one, one uh, choice of, uh, <coughs> one choice of these uh, kind of averaging, sometimes in physics it would be called block spin variables. So the average, average, average of the coupling. Rather than doing that, uh, it's more it's, uh, useful to do a somewhat more sophisticated limit, in which we we'll, we will take a limit in which uh, this thing, which we'll soon see, is a Markov chain indexed by these integer points, which you can start thinking of as times rather than space. Uh, uh, take a limit in which what you get the limit is a process on, uh, that's a continuous, continuous time variable. So we'll take a limit which is the casting process in, in continuous time. So, uh, so and then and then after that we can use that process to generate random variables which have this pure imaginary zeros property. So we will we want to do the following: we want to separate. Uh, the uh, limit procedure uh, the <coughs> procedure of uh, getting limit limit variables limit variables with the pure imaginary zeros property into two parts. PIZ was my uh, acronym for pure imaginary zeros. PIZ property into two parts. So part one is what we call the scaling limit.
of Sn. So you think of the, the Sn's are indexed by integers uh, in a limit will get a limiting process indexed by continuous continuous variable which reverse time. The a stochastic process. S of T of, of the continuous one-dimensional time variable. Uh, the, as an easing model, this the index the this I ran from one to n. You thought of it as a one-dimensional spatial variable, but you know, it's up to you what you, how you want to think of it. You could think of it as a one-dimensional time variable. And that's the more conventional thing, is the best capacity. And so the continuous thing, you know, you think of it as a time variable. Uh, T replacing the discrete, the discrete variable I. So this is a, a, a perfectly a conventional standard uh, thing to do. In, this is uh, this is actually still undergraduate level, sort of advanced undergraduate level, uh, in which uh, I don't know if we have this done in our course that's called the theory of probability, but could be done there. Uh, uh, it's closely related to something that probably is done there, which is uh, uh, it's the relation between uh, uh, independent probability variables and the uh, 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 classic Poisson process in time. Anyway, uh, for those of you who have now those kinds of things will, uh, everything will be very familiar. Um, okay, so th that will be, so we'll do a, a limiting a limiting process uh, uh, without the lambdas. There's no lambda, uh, well, uh, 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 there aren't really any lambdas, there won't be any lambdas in this process. Uh, if I will be uh, somehow rescaled to get the T, um, And uh, then, then once you've done that, then then you can construct variables out of this S, which will have the pure imaginary zeros property. Uh, for the for the for, for the original variables, you you did uh, positive linear combinations. And so here you'll do an integration uh, against a positive uh, test function. And this function lambda will be a non negative function. Now this will be a variable with the pure variable. property. Or these kinds of things will be non variables with the PIZ property. So one will get a whole family of such things because you can then take this uh, function to be very general. Um, okay, so, so so this is how we're going to break up things. And I'm, I'm going to avoid um, most you know, technical issues because they're, they're, they aren't very complicated or pretty standard. Uh, so you have <coughs> a very nice theorem about sequences and random variables. And now I'm kind of, sort of interchanging some limits and things. Uh, in fact, there's no problem with any of this stuff because uh, this this theorem was extremely robust, and so it can withstand all kinds of changes. Uh, so I will simply claim uh, that, that the thing we end up with will have the property that as long as the lambda is such that this is a well-defined random variable, for example, that it exists in the L2 sense. Then there's no problem, and it will have it will be in this Liang class. Okay. Uh, 
Well, we're, <coughs> I mean, we're now more interested in the kinds of things we get rather than the technical issues of uh, uh, kind of the process of doing it. Okay. So, uh, but I want to make a comment uh, that I don't say at the beginning that we get kind of obscure calculations. Um, so one thing that, uh, that one already learns from this simple Curie Weiss model, as I said before, is that to get an interesting limit, uh, uh, if, if there's a beta parameter in the model, and there is here, that, that beta over there, I haven't defined the model, but I did define the model. Uh, when you take your limit, you ought to be taking this parameter going to its approaching its critical value. If you don't do that, if it's say above the critical value, uh, the beta is less than the critical value. If you take a limit with beta that stays strictly below the critical value, not away from the critical value, then then, then you're in the, you're in the in the in the domain of all approximately independent variables, and that any kind of limit you take will be normally distributed, and so that's not so interesting. Okay. Now, as we'll see in a moment, uh, in in this case, in a sense, the critical value is at beta equals infinity. So you have to take that kind of limit. So, uh, like in the Curie Weiss model, <coughs> we want to want to have beta sub n approach the critical value. Dimensions. This is the one dimension there's never model. We've been studying this now. Two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. Is that one dimension is considered a not very physically good situation because it does not have a critical value at a finite value of beta. something other than basically a normal distribution or Gaussian process kind of limit that you need to uh, let beta and go to infinity. So in a sense, infinity is the critical value of the one-dimensional Isaac model. Uh, by the way, I think I mentioned in the first uh, in the first talk that the Isaac model is named after Ising because it was the topic of his PhD thesis in physics from around 1926 or something of that sort. He actually, uh, his thesis was actually about the one-dimensional case, and <coughs> he uh, realized, it's not so hard to point that out, that for any finite beta, you don't have any kind of interesting behavior. And so he concluded that, oh, probably that's the same thing in any dimension. That turned out to be wrong, and that was uh, shown to be wrong only some years later by 
uh, I think it was done by Rudolf Pyrrhus, who's a I guess this is the one Nobel Prize for other things. Um, but nevertheless, uh, since uh, Easing really his advisor, uh, uh, Lenz, one of the first people to work in the model, it, it got his name. Uh, anyway, he, he actually studied the one dimensional things. Um, which is. Kind of the critical value. I mean, you, uh, that, that is, letting beta n go to infinity, obviously in this case you can only do it from below. That would, that, that's sort of analogous to letting the beta n approach 1 be negative, so you're approaching it from below in that model. Anyway, yeah, th th this is uh, just for relation to the physics situation. <coughs> you don't need to, I mean, we'll just, this will come out anyway automatically when we do the limit. Okay, so, okay, so this may sound, uh, so it, uh, th th this may sound, you know, complicated, especially if you don't have, don't have any background in this kind of physics or mathematical physics, but if you have some background in uh, elementary probability and even elementary stochastic processes, well, stochastic processes is sophisticated. Just uh, the kind we're going to work with now are just Markov chains, which are the simplest, except for independent sequences, the simplest possible uh, 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 discrete time stochastic processes. And these, in particular, because they only take two values, plus one and minus one. Uh, so that's, that's all you all you need. Uh, and even if even <laughs> Even if you don't know that, it's, it should be almost self-contained. Okay, so <coughs> okay, so here's the here's the point. So now I'll explain what I've been saying. Uh, and uh, so 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 we're looking at uh, our system of variables we have is. For each n, we have n plus or minus one value n variables with a certain specific distribution, right? It's this joint distribution where this is the this is the sum where the only non-zero things that appear there are when i and j are next to each other right? as integers. So here's the claim, and then we'll actually we'll derive this. The one-dimensional Here's the neighbor model that we're talking about. <coughs> yes. It's in in the variable thing about is plus or minus one. Uh, that we that we just defined. Uh, it's that, that formula for the joint distribution <coughs> is this with this uh, set of FLJs is in fact, and uh, you don't know what I'm about to write uh, means, then I'm going to explain it. It's a stationary plus or minus one value markup chain. So hopefully uh, hopefully there are a few people here where all the stuff about easing models is uh, maybe boring, but markup chains are comfortable. Uh, with transition matrix, the discrete time, which this is, these are things times going from one to n. Uh, uh, street time markup chain with only finally many values is described by a matrix. Transition matrix, which I call capital T, and in this case, uh, you can write it down. The transition matrix, oh, in fact, let me, before I write it down, let me tell you or remind you what a transition matrix means. Uh, or in the case where you only have values plus one or minus one, uh, 
it, it tells you what the conditional probability of the next value in time is given the current value in time. So if you know what the what the value of this is at time i, then you want to know what is the conditional probability of the value one time later. So, uh, so in general, if you had finally many possible states, here's only two, you would put in every possible state here and every possible state here, and you would have a matrix of probabilities. That's the transition matrix. So I hope there's some people that was familiar. Uh, so in this case, you would have the values of minus one and plus one, minus one and plus one, and that, that would give you here a two by two matrix, which I'm now going to write down. And here's the two by two matrix. something first I need to normalize it. So there's one one e to the two beta e to the two beta now this is has to be normalized. So uh, so the, these the, the locations here represent I guess minus one plus one minus one plus one. So this is supposed to represent the probability that the next value is is plus one given that the previous value I'm oh, sorry the next value is minus one given that the previous value is plus one and this is plus one to plus one no, <coughs> this is minus one to minus one uh, minus one to plus one etc. This is so symmetric, it doesn't matter if I get it mixed up. Uh, anyway, the, the sums, the sums along the rows have to add up to 1, because there's supposed to be probabilities if I start from one value, what are the next values I get? So they have to add up to 1. And so this could be right, but if I divide by e to the beta plus 1, those, those are you know, two positive numbers that add up to 1, so there's probabilities. OK, so that represents. Uh, so for example, this starting in minus, starting in plus one and going to minus one uh, is what one of these things in the these two corners, which is one over e to the two beta plus one. Okay, so so uh, I'm going to prove this, right? It's just uh, uh, it's an elementary cal calculation. Uh, why, why this formula, which is written in a kind of different, uh, and this formula with our uh, nearest neighbor choice coupling uh, corresponds to that, right? It's, it's an elementary calculation, but uh, I'll dignify it by calling it a proof. It's basically a calculation. Uh, so let me let me take a slightly different matrix which isn't normalized. This is supposed to be a transition matrix, so it has to be normalized so that the rows uh, the row sums add up to one. Let's take a different matrix. That's fine. Where uh, both of these are, take the values plus one or minus one. And each of those takes one of those values. Uh, and I'm going to take this to be simply e to the beta s s prime. I'm taking that because that's the main uh, thing that appears in this thing in our nearest neighbor case. Because you have uh, you have a, if, the, if, the, if j is i plus one, then you have a factor that looks like e to the beta s i s i plus one. Actually, you have two of them, but you also have a one half, so they multiply together. 
because I, 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 summed, I summed over all indices, including my J and JI. Okay, that is to say, this matrix is e to the beta, e to the minus beta, e to the minus beta, e to the beta. These are when the two things are the same, then you get a plus sign. These are when the two things are different, you get a minus sign. Okay, then uh, if you plug into this formula, the choice of the Jij only being, being zero, except when i and j are next to each, each next to each other, and uh, in that case it is beta. Well, I, I, I replaced beta n by beta, we'll let beta depend on the end soon. Uh, and then, uh, then you can rewrite this formula for this nearest neighbor case in terms of this matrix. That's an elementary calculation. In fact, let's write down the, uh, the formula for <coughs> the probability that these n variables each takes certain values. Uh, I mean, I should, I could assign this as a homework exercise, except that you no, know, a lot of people would do it, and then you would think this is something complicated. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm now basically rewriting that, uh, that <coughs> this thing. Uh, that thing. Okay, so that is basically this factor. Uh, the one half, uh, so the, that's with JJ equal to beta, JJ equal to this, right? I, I, I just made this a fixed beta temporarily. It's zero except when they're nearest neighbors, and because I'm summing over both, over all i and j, uh, I get, you know, it appears twice, one for i, i plus one, and one for i plus one i. So you've got a factor of each of the one half beta, and another factor is going to have beta, so those two multiply and give you a beta. So that that is that is this factor. Uh, and since you only go from one to n, uh, you, know, you don't have anything beyond that because there's no very there's no n plus one variable. The only problem with that is that uh, if you took that as your as your Supposed probability, if you added that up over all possible two to the n choices, it went that up to one. So it has to be normalized to be a probability measure. So there's some constant which is you know, diff different than this constant because I haven't taken into account these factors of one half. But it's whatever you need to normalize it to be a probability measure. Okay, so I hope, I hope, I hope you see that. This is just another way of writing the uh, when you pick the values plus one and minus one, that's no longer there, except for the one half, so which get absorbed into the constant. And so that is just that is just this. And JIJ is beta. Right, we'll soon let beta depend upon n. But for the time being it doesn't. For the time being it's just a particular value of n. Well, but I can rewrite this in terms of this matrix. This is just this is just product of one to n minus one of these uh, these matrix elements. So if these are the same, you get e to the beta. If these are different, you get e to the minus beta. That's the same as this. Well, uh, so th those of you who have uh, 
seen Marco chains know that part of a finite Marco chain only goes from times one to n, then the joint distribution of those variables, those n variables, is basically given by the product of the transition probabilities, because you have to go, you start somewhere, and you go to the next one, and you go to the next one, and you go to the next one. Well, it would be the ones for this, but, but uh, this, uh, okay, so the, uh, we'll, we'll get to this one, but so you, but you get something which looks like a product of matrices. The only thing that's confusing is, you know, from getting between this matrix and that matrix. Uh, so let me explain how that goes. I mean, you would, if it's a, if it's a, I need to I need to simply argue that this thing can be rewritten as a product of uh, with the elements of this matrix. So that's just uh, uh, fiddling around with things. Uh, so that involves that I will need as an exercise changing the constant. I'm using that. I mean, this matrix is not a transition matrix, but you just have to multiply by this to make it into a transition matrix using that 1 over e to the beta plus e to the minus beta m equals t. Okay, so that's that's a little calculation. <laughs> right, e to the beta divided by e to the beta plus e to the 1 minus beta. Hopefully, it's the same as e to the 2 beta over e to the 2 beta plus 1. Uh, I'm relying on my having checked that six months ago. Uh, gives, allows me to rewrite this formula in terms of this T matrix. Gives that this thing equals. Prime here, it's a different constant. The product from 1 to n minus 1 of the T, T matrix of entries. But this, this is the formula for, uh, for, for the joint distribution of a Markov chain because the probability that you have this value, then this value, and this value is gotten by taking all the transitions from one to the next and multiplying them together. This means that it means that SN is that is this sequence of variables is a Markov chain. Um, I, I, I okay, so that's that's already uh, a Markov chain with transition matrix T. But there's one more claim, which is that this is a stationary, stationary Markov chain. Stationary Markov chain means that the, the probability of the variable at any given time is stays the same. Uh, but that's easy to check. Uh, to check stationarity. Uh, if you look at the, if you look at this formula, well, look at this formula. Uh, this formula has the property that uh, the probability of any value of any of these is equal to the same probability for the negative of that value, because the, this whole distribution is invariant under changing all of these things to minus themselves simultaneously. Because, because of the quadratic form uh, and there's no linear term. Symmetry by that symmetry. By the symmetry between plus one and minus one uh, for all the variables simultaneously follows the probability that um, for any any i, a particular i equal to one. Equal, they have to add up to one, so it's going to be half each, and that is that is the invariant distribution of this uh, 
transition matrix, so just easily check. And the probability vector of one half in this case is a is a stationary distribution because it's left invariant when you left multiply or right multiply by this matrix. So one one half one half one half. Normally you would have you know you have six values and you have a vector with six positive numbers adding up to one. That would be a stationary distribution if you multiply from the left that vector by the matrix and you have a stationary invariant. So And for this case, it's the only, only one. So, so we now have a, uh, a Markov, Markov chain finite, uh, times one through n uh, with this simple condition matrix and it's and, and stationary, which in this case is symmetric. Describe, uh, you know, again, this is something very familiar to people with a little, little modest amount of uh, uh, background in stochastic processes. That uh, it's you know, really standard to take discrete time processes like Markov chains and take limits in which the discrete time becomes continuous time. <coughs> you get a continuous time process, which is what we're going to do, and, and what we're going to do is completely standard one, uh, so there's nothing at all uh, special about this. It's just, you know, seeing, seeing it in the, in the language of the easy model, and it's, it, this is all well known. Uh, I, want to, I want to describe it, uh, you know, in kind of detail, because of the limit that we're what we're going to get here in the limit will be a continuous time process, which also takes the values plus one and minus one. Uh, and it's, it's those of you who know about those things can already guess what, what, what it is. There's not much choice. Uh, next week, we're going to start with the analogous situation, but instead of having the easy model, we'll have the XY model. Then we have a Markov chain, which takes values on the unit circle. Uh, and the limit will get a continuous time process on the unit circle. So that one is a kind of more interesting process than we we'll get today because that one involves Brownian motion. This one is also be much more elementary. Uh, and then, and then, <coughs> seminar after that, the last one, we're going to discuss what might happen, or what is thought to happen, when you go from the circle value being in the one-dimensional nearest neighbor context to the circle value thing in the two-dimensional context? There, much less is known, but what conjectures. And furthermore, it's conceivable that that one. Uh, might have some relation to the grand policy. Maybe. Uh, anyway, we'll let the girls to us continue talking about this for a little bit. Um, so I just want to describe the, I want to describe uh, the, the general setting to completely standard for how you take a limit to get continuous time. Um, uh, and then, then we'll have a little break and then we'll, then we'll continue. So, um, so, uh, so this is this is part one. So in the part one, part 
Because, because this is a stationary uh, Markov chain, uh, we started at time 1 and went to time n. But since it's stationary, uh, you could have started at time minus n and gone to time plus n, or stayed at time minus, minus anything and gone to plus anything. In fact, because it's stationary, you could, start, you could let the time that you start go off to minus infinity, and you would have a stationary Markov chain indexed by all integers, positive or negative. Uh, so that's convenient, so I'll do that. that. That's not really necessary, but it's sort of convenient. Uh, since uh, since uh, we have a stationary Markov chain, it's easy to uh, you can start any time in the past, and it's still stationary. Uh, stationary chain. Uh, and change the discrete index to be uh, in all of the all of the positive or negative integers, because the you start, you obviously you could start at time minus 24 and run it up to time plus 53, but if you look at any finite region, it's, it looks exactly the same as this one. And so there's no problem with taking the limit. But you still get a perfectly nice process. Uh, okay. uh, so, so we have to so that. So now, if you have the process super n, uh, is, you know, is the stationary process a discrete time still as I and such an I as small as Z with the addition matrix the one we wrote, but it's a beta map depends upon depends upon the end. E to the two beta and Plus one inverse times e to the two beta e to the two beta n. So uh, in the limit, we'll. So I'm just saying what we expect to get, and then we'll talk about that after the break. In the limit, we'll have a stationary process in continuous time. Still plus or minus one value. This is T. I'm sorry, the stationary. That's a T. Yes. T in R. So that's what we want to limit. So it's convenient to take our stationary process, and even though the time really was discrete, we can make it continuous, sort of, by simply making it piecewise constant. Uh, but uh, the standard way, the standard way of doing that would be make, making it piecewise constant on intervals of smaller and smaller time lengths, basically side 1 over n. So, uh, so it's convenient to embed the discrete time process, this i n, into continuous time, simply by, by making it piecewise constant on time intervals of length 1 over n in any reasonable way. Uh, in this time. So here's, here's a new way of doing that. So we'll call that S super n of t. 
So this is a this is a sequence of processes. It's the same end as here. The time is continuous, but it's that sort of fake because it really is piecewise constant. So it's really really discrete time. Just make believe it's continuous time. By doing uh, basically the following, take the greatest integer in n t, or, or the greatest integer less than or equal to n t, then then uh, the integer changes every every whenever the time changes by one over n. And it's constant on intervals of length one over n, and one over jumps. Uh, this is said more, more concretely. That's S on J for T between, I guess, J over n and J over n plus one. So that's piecewise constant. Uh, Given by this this uh, this stationary discrete time process, I uh, just make these respects and I take the length one over n. Uh, okay, and then we want to talk about the limit of this as n goes to infinity. And then when we when we start doing that, which we'll do in a moment, that's when you have to now decide. How beta should go to, to do this and get something interesting? You have to let beta go to infinity, uh, and but that's what we expected from this discussion. But you have to let it go to infinity in a certain way, and we'll see how you do that just by its own little calculation. So uh, I think maybe this is a maybe this is a good time to stop. Okay, so we'll continue from there. Let's take a short break. So now we want to talk about uh, taking this limit, and we'll see that we're uh, forced to get a to get a, uh, a natural limit. Uh, we're sort of forced to that or it's natural to let beta approach infinity, or beta super n approach infinity with n in a specific way. Um, so a good way of seeing how, how that should be, how the beta n should be chosen, is by thinking about the this discrete time chain, even though it's embedded in continuous time, and seeing how long you have to wait until the value changes from plus one to minus one or minus one to plus one. So um, at each Time step. So time step was you know, was now time time steps are size one over n. Uh, the probability of changing from whatever value you are to the other value is s super n flips. That means either changes from plus one to minus one or from minus one to plus one flips uh, with probability. One over one plus e to the two beta n. So let's ask how long you have to wait until the next flip happens. So for so for k a natural number. Uh, probability that the time to the next flip is at least as long as k steps. Well, that means that k times or k minus one times you did not flip. So probability of not flipping is 1 minus 1 over 1 plus e to the 2 beta n. And you have to not flip and then not flip and then not flip k minus 1 times. So this. Okay, so uh, so it's natural uh, to 
uh, because we're, we're, we're looking for a limit in which uh, something happens in the new macroscopic time variable t, so you want to take uh, k to be proportional to n. Oh, this is a reminder that you're supposed to sign up. Uh, so, if you let k grow with n linearly, so that this goes to a value s, which will be a time in the, the rescale limiting variable. Uh, then, then we want beta to go to infinity in such a way that this has a, a limit which is neither zero nor one. Beta n goes to infinity such that n over one plus e beta n. Well, I'll, 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 I'll let me write it, but I'll see why that's the final calculation. Those two constant r is zero infinity. Uh, so, uh, by, 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 uh, by taking that kind of limit, that means that that would mean that that would mean that this thing looks like this would look like 1 minus r over n this r over n is basically this thing and k or k minus 1 doesn't matter that that's growing like constant times n, so this would look like f times n. So this would go to e to the minus r n. So that's why that's chosen. I'll rewrite this in a moment. Uh, then you would get and you get that uh, ability of time to next flip. Uh, right, equal to, I'm sorry, the gradient of the S. Time to the next flip would have a tail given by an exponential formula that is definition or a definition of the exponential distribution. So that is uh, an exponential distribution. Limit in the limit exponential distribution uh, of b one over r. R is the rate of one over r is the mean time to take uh, it takes before there's a uh, Okay, now this is, this can be, uh, this is saying as, uh, saying that, equivalently, uh, uh, beta n looks like, sorry, beta n goes to infinity like one, one half of log n. This is a constant, the constant would be, Real number, which is minus one down the of R. Anyway, it, it means if you want to pick beta to go to in a particular way, namely like like one half log n plus a constant. Okay. Uh, so this leads to, as I'm saying the notes, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be very precise because 
the kind of the kind of limit that you have uh, doesn't matter a great deal because one has one has this very strong theorem that we talked about the last time, and so anything anything you get will <laughs> will have this uh, will be in this Liang class. So here's the theorem, uh, not very precisely stated, but it's not, that's not the thing that's of interest. Uh, so, uh, so take beta n uh, to do what we just said, uh, such that beta n minus one f log n goes to the field constant. Uh, this can be positive or negative. The R could be uh, bigger than one or bigger than one. Uh, and, and this, and this uh, discrete time process embedded into, into a continuous time uh, converges distribution to it was a stationary process in discrete time, the limit will be a stationary process in continuous time, and stationary continuous time uh, plus or minus the one value mark of process uh, which jumps Clips. B is a free parameter, uh, and, and pick whatever you want to get that rate. Well, we will, just uh, convenience, we'll choose a particular value of B in the moment. Okay, so uh, actually for calculus, so so that that's the that's the claim, and uh, and it's it basically a consequence of this this uh, this calculation here, which is not this. So there's nothing, I mean, it's a very conventional uh, kind of limit theorem for Markov chains going to a nearest time Markov process. These are called Markov jump processes because they jump at random times with exponential leading to among the different values. But the, so again, that's the kind of thing, those kind of nearest time jump processes are standards things studied in upper level undergraduate stochastic process courses. And these days, I guess, in elementary financial math courses, <laughs> I think. Uh, okay, so I, I, I want to uh, I want to say a little bit more about this process uh, so then I can write down some Comments and questions about about the process uh, because now this process by this part two uh, this process will give us a whole bunch of random variables or distributions which have the pure imaginary zeros property. So uh, so the following thing is uh, the following thing is convenient. So uh, so the, the way the way this was organized was that. You wait for an exponential time uh, uh, whose mean is, I guess, e to the 2b. And then you flip to the other value. Because of the symmetry between plus 1 and minus 1, you could organize it slightly differently, and that's convenient for some calculations. You could, you could, look, at, you could look at a process with twice the rate so you wait you know, with an exponential uh, distribution with half of the mean. 
But then instead of changing the other value, you plus a coin, a fair coin. If it comes up heads, you stay the same as you are. If it comes up tails, you go to the other value. Uh, that's statistically equivalent to this model. Is that the pro property of ex exponential distributions and geometric distributions that I'm going to bother you with. But that, that's, that's convenient for some calculational purposes. So let, let's, let's, mention, let's do that. So this is equivalent equivalently with twice the rate 2 to minus 2b. You make a transition. The transition uh, is in quotes because the transition, you decide whether to change your value. So you may decide to stay the same value. So just like here, and this is called the transition matrix, but sometimes you, you keep the same value. Um, make a transition, uh, quotes. It's really, it's really an update. You update the value, update, but you're, up, you're updating, updating. <laughs> you're updating. A procedure is you toss a fair coin, the probability one half, you keep the value you're, you're, you have, and the probability one half, you go to the opposite value. Uh, you update. To plus one or minus one with probably half for each. Okay, let's do one more thing uh, for convenience. We'll take d to be log two divided by two. So, so this rate is now become so this rate equals one. So with rate one, which means you wait an exponential mean one amount of time, and then you do this kind of update. Okay, that, uh, okay, then, then you can define the process the following way. Uh, let you be uh, a, a random variable with such an exponential mean one distribution. Represents uh, the typical waiting time until you do an update. Uh, then, then you can write down the covariance of this process at two different times. So, one of the uh, this is a stationary stationary plus or minus one value process. So one of the things you look at in stationary processes are the mean and the variance or kind of covariance. Uh, the mean is zero because it's equally likely to be plus one or minus one. Uh, the covariance is can be calculated the following way. Uh, you can think about when I think of T1 less less than T2, I guess. Well, that doesn't matter the way I'll write it. But think of T1 less than T2. Uh, between time T1 and T2, there might be no no update. There's no update, and this is the same as that, and then conditionally they're equal, so the covariance would be one. If there is an update, then conditionally they become uncorrelated because you're equally likely to, to, to take the opposite sign. So this would be one times the probability that no update between T1 and T2 plus zero times the probability that there is an update. There is an update. Uh, well, the probability of no update is the probability that this waiting time for an update has not happened by, by time t, the difference between T2 and T1 u is typically greater than t2 minus t1, but that's an exponential v1, so this is simply e to the minus t2 minus t1. So that's a little calculation that gives you a nice simple formula for the covariance of this thing. Okay, well this is convenient because 
uh, I claim sort of based on this kind of theorem, or even weaker ones, well, this is more than enough, that because this thing was a limit of uh, discrete processes which, discrete time processes which satisfy the uh, property and that for pure imaginary zeros property and then various approximating variables were in this class, any limiting variable of, of the right kind will be in the class of, as long as it's a really a well-defined variable and it's more than enough if the limiting variable has finite second moment. So, uh, so, so here's the corollary. The corollary of this theorem. So if you have a function of t non-negative, because we want to take limits of limits of positive linear combinations, in the limit you're going to have an integral of a positive function. It's such that. But let, let me leave this uh, for a second. What I want to look at is this random variable w, which is the integral of h of t, s of t. s of t is our stationary, continuous time, plus or minus one value process. This is the variable I want to look at. And I claim that as long as it's a well-defined variable, for example, it has a finite second moment, then it can be obtained as a limit of things from the Liang class, and therefore will be the Liang class. Uh, is a mean zero, uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm leaving some spaces in the class Ly. And so it has the pure imaginary zeros property. So all I need is some condition which makes this a decent random variable and uh, a, a, a perfectly fine condition. This is probably the look may look too strong, but it's actually probably the weak issue we do is that it has finite second moment. Uh, and the finite second moment, you can write down what, what you need for that because you have a formula for the covariance. So uh, so here's the here's what you get. The double integral of h of t1, h of t2, e to the minus t2 minus t1, uh, dt1, dt2. That's less than infinity. Call this v for variance. If, if, if h is a um, non, uh, yes, if h is a non-negative. Uh, integrable function, a locally integrable function, such that this is true, then that will be enough so that this is obtained as a limit of the discrete things, and therefore uh, this random variable will uh, be a random variable. It will be a class, and we'll have this variance. Okay, so this this uh, so the, so the, this is uh, this is this is a part two actually. Right, we got the process that was a theorem. Now the corollary is now you can construct uh, these uh, integrals with positive test functions, which will have the, have this pure imaginary zeros property. Okay. Um, so. Uh, 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 I, I, um, I, I don't. Th this is not a deep fact, but I don't think it's a kind of well-known thing. Uh, on the other hand, I doubt very much that it is useful for the Riemann hypothesis. But I don't. I don't have a proof that it's not useful. Uh, that would be kind of interesting. I mean, a little bit interesting to show that this cannot be something with uh, with this with this distribution. 
On the other hand, it would be even more interesting if you could show that there is a choice of age which has this distribution. So there are some there's some remarks on this last page about that kind of question. Um, uh, so uh, you know, some some of them are there to demonstrate that that if, if you want to have if you want to if you want to try to get something which uh, which might has a chance of being that human hypothesis thing, then uh, you can already rule out you know, lots of choices for age. So, for example, uh, uh, bounded support you can rule out. Uh, you can actually rule out an integrable age, integral, integral over the whole real line. Uh, so, so some. So here's let me quickly write some of these remarks. Uh, so some, ma many, many uh, uh, kinds of, ma many choices for H cannot uh, possibly give uh, distribution C psi of U D W. Uh, so, for example, uh, if H of T has bounded support, say supported on finite interval, uh, bounded interval line, then. Uh, then it, it can't it can't be this it can't have this distribution because it actually uh, is not a continuous distribution. It has a positive probability of having the value plus one or minus one. Then uh, let's call this uh, let's call this WH. Uh, and WH. Uh, as distribution with atoms at plus and minus one uh, because because there is strictly positive probability that uh, S of T has no updates in this time interval. The probability that it has no updates in this time interval is e to the minus t2 minus t1. You know, you start at time t1 and, and wait for an exponential amount of time until the next update happens. And the, the probability that you're still waiting is e to the minus t2 minus t1. That means there wasn't an update. If there was no update, then whatever value you started with at time t1, you have all the way through. And that would mean that that this thing equals, and there's equal probability of starting with plus one or minus one because it's a stationary. So you would have probability at least you have probably e to the minus t2 minus t1 uh, times one half of being of this thing equaling plus the integral from t1 to t2 of h. Uh, well, that which would just be the whole integral of h. Uh, and probability means one half of e to the minus t2 minus t1 of being uh, minus 1. Uh, minus one times that integral. Uh, <laughs> well, it's written down here. I've said it rather, rather quickly because I want to get to some other things. So, uh, WH would have atoms size size. Uh, Half t to the minus t2 minus t1 uh, 
have the values plus or minus integral of h of t This doesn't have any atoms. This has a this has a, a continuous density on the whole real line. Okay, uh, I, so that's an example. Here's another example. If h of t is integrable, then w sub h is founded. That is to say, there's zero probability of it getting bigger than some constant or getting less than minus that constant. Uh, that's the big values between plus or minus the integral. <coughs> right, because let's look at the formula. Uh, this is no bigger than plus one times the integral and no less than minus one times the integral. So any value that it has has to be in between these two finite numbers. That means it's a bounded random variable. So its distribution is, has bounded support. But this distribution does not have bounded support. This density is non-zero all the way between minus and infinity. It has a small probability of being big, but it has some probability of being big. So, uh, so both both, the, both, the, both this uh, and having atoms uh, rule out this this being that remnant hypothesis thing. So that it's easy to rule out something. In fact, this you know the, the, this sort of suggests where you might try to look in this case. Although, as I said, I don't. I would be pleasantly surprised <laughs> if it turned out that you know, there was a choice of H for, which gave you this density. I think I, I, that'd be uh, change that language. I would be pleasantly shocked. Uh, uh, however, uh, you, you can, you know, I mean, here we ruled out some things. You could take the other tack and say, well, what should I do if I want to get something that you know, has a chance of being like this. Well, this one, you know, is not bounded, bounded support. It can have arbitrary large values, but the probability of a large value goes to zero with e to the minus pi e to the 2x. So, so that suggests that you want something where this is infinite, but sort of only barely infinite. Uh, so that's that's my that's what I have at the bottom of this page. Questions: What behavior? So we 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 see some some behaviors are you know give you something that where the random variable isn't isn't big enough to have to enough probability of large values like no probability of large values. What behavior of h of t as t goes to infinity? Uh, uh, would lead to lead to uh, the tail behavior that is the the way the the density of the distribution looks like for large absolute value of t like e to minus a constant e to the two w because that's what that's how this behaves. From the leading term in this uh, sum. Well, I don't know the answer to that. But I, I, I don't think it's so hard to figure out, but I never sort of sat down and tried it. But it's it, heuristically, it seems like it should be something which, oh, this, ha this has to be infinite, but it should be something because this tail goes to zero so fast, it's kind of like it's unbounded, but almost bounded, sort of. So that suggests to me that uh, this is not integral at infinity, but only sort of barely so. So maybe, maybe 
H of T looking like you know, constant over uh, uh, T to some power of a logarithm. Well, I guess you want the power not to be to assign this to my students in an element. I want the power to be less than equal. Should be smaller than one, right? Even one. Why do you should be? <laughs> uh, anyway, that's, you know. <laughs> but but this, this part, you know, this is some kind of classical analysis of something you know, we'll figure this out. I never kind of tried it hard because I'm pessimistic about it. <laughs> Giving you, I mean, even if you've got. So, so, so undoubtedly, there is some choice of tail of, of, of large t behavior of h, which will give you exactly the right asymptotic behavior of the density that matches that. But of course, that's only you no. Know, that's that doesn't say it's this. I mean, uh, uh, okay. Then, then, you know, then my final my final comment here, uh, which is you know, which is not the pessimistic version uh, can it be proved that no choice of H uh, is WH distributed as this uh, C, uh, C side so that's, that's, I think that's that my guess is that this is a correct conjecture uh, but if you, you, uh, if you prove that uh, Probably that result would be publishable, but not probably in a very good journal. <laughs> On the other hand, of course, if you, know, you, you did the opposite, that not only would it be publishable, but you would win a million dollars, and that would be probably the smallest benefit you would get from that. <laughs> The, the, uh, so the, the, the last, the, the last, the paragraph in the bottom of the last page of these notes um, is, was not supposed to be here. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but uh, that wasn't. That, that, that was that's about the XY models, which we actually talked about last time, and we'll talk about it again. But it was a mistake that I left it, left it, left it here. I, I, I you may guess from the way this thing looks that I. Did not rewrite uh, all of this stuff uh, anew, but uh, uh, copied things from. It. Of course, I get less semester in New York. Uh, anyway, I just forgot to get rid of that paragraph. Uh, so next, uh, so maybe I spend the last few minutes just uh, saying uh, a little bit more about what what I plan to do next week. Next week, uh, we're going to do uh, the analogous discussion, but instead of the one-dimensional nearest neighbor easing model, we'll we'll be talking about the one-dimensional nearest neighbor XY model. Next week, we consider the, the scaling limit. Uh, this kind of limiting procedure in which you let so we, we, uh, we took the lattice spacing, which in the original discrete times was spacing one. The time steps were size one, and we made the time step one over n. So uh, in, in the more general context, where the indices would come not necessarily from a one-dimensional set of indices, but two or three-dimensional, then the spacing between the nearest neighbor indices is called the lattice spacing. 
and here the last space here is one over n. Again, as one, we replace it by one over n, and we put that to uh, zero. Uh, that's that kind of situation is called a scaling. It's an example of a scaling limit. Uh, so we will we will do that. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, but for uh, the one-dimensional nearest neighbor xy model, so that's where instead of instead of plus minus one value plus minus one value variables, we have uh, s uh, i uh, taking values value in the circle. Uh, and then the that case be continued. Uh, it's, it's still, the, the time variables are just like here. We take the basics that we want over n, and now we take a some kind of limit. In the limit, you will get a uh, unit circle value, random process in continuous time. It will also be stationary process uh, with continuous stationary circle value process will be uh, Brownian motion uh, kind of wrapped around the circle. So Brownian motion is a real value process, but you can take the real value and work into the e to the i that real value, and then we get something in the unit circle of the complex plane. That's a circle value process. If you want to make it stationary, you just take it times zero. You just take the original Brownian variable and set it to zero to take the uniform distribution between minus pi and pi, and then you get a stationary process on the circle. Um, that's what the limit will be, uh, and so there are certain functionals of that process analogous to these kinds of uh, these kinds of things, except instead of this, you have sort of that circle that in the process, this, this, is that, in this case, would be replaced by looking at the first coordinate of that process on the circle. That also will, will have the period and zero's property. And then, of course, you can ask the similar, similar questions. Uh, in that case, you don't get atoms because it's on a circle, but, uh, but you would still have the same property about this non-interpability. Uh, and of course, you can ask the same questions there. And I also don't think that that one will give you a your hypothesis. But then the last week, we'll discuss <coughs> the two-dimensional Mary's neighbor XY model. Uh, there, there, uh, some things are known, and I'll talk about some of those things. That one, unlike uh, uh, this one, just like the easing case, does not have a finite critical beta. You have to let beta go to infinity. Two dimensions does have a finite critical beta. Um, uh, the phase transition for the, the same time model is very interesting and been studied for many years, uh, and a certain amount of lots of things are known about it. Um, uh, so uh, you don't have to let beta go to infinity here, but you might you may want to, or not. It's all unclear. But uh, this uh, the, the, this uh, here the the. The na nature of the limit is not so well understood. It is expected that it is, in some cases, proved in a way uh, Wu and I are working on things of that sort, that the, uh, that the uh, limit, is, in some cases, is related to some much a recently studied kind of object, which is the Gaussian free field, uh, which would sort of potentially play the role that the Brownian motion does in the one dimensional case. Uh, and there, there I would be, uh, I would not conjecture that you 
cannot get the Riemann hypothesis in that setting. I don't know how to do it, but there, there it is. Uh, it's sufficiently complicated a system that you know it, there's more there's more things to explore. <laughs> okay, so uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. to that. Um, it, it, yeah, I, I, uh, uh, yeah, that's a nice, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh I, I have a comment that's slightly related to that answer. Uh, so a, a more general uh, uh, something that uh, this that question could be a special case of something else, uh, which is uh, you know some people uh, could perfectly reasonably say okay this sounds this approach sounds interesting, but I don't think it will work. Uh, how might you prove that this whole thing doesn't work? That would include this special case. It is, no limit of things. Well, sorry. Yeah, no limit of things coming from easing or X Y models could uh, could uh, could could actually be this thing. Okay. So uh, actually, I have more to say about the easing case. That is, I explored a particular version of, of, of a method how you might do that for the X Y case. It doesn't uh, easing case doesn't apply to the X Y case as far as I know. Easing models satisfy other. Uh, Properties besides the Liang pure imaginary zeros property. Uh, for example, the moment generating function, if you take the logarithmic derivative for real z, uh, it's convex on the positive half line. That's something related to called the Griffiths or Sherman inequality. Uh, and it's known that that's a property that's disjoint from the pure imaginary zeros property. That is, you can do examples of models which have one and not the other in either direction. So uh, I actually explored once whether whether uh, whether this thing uh, has that kind of property. And uh, it turns out that uh, that property is a, is, a, is a simpler thing to investigate than I mean, that's saying something about the, you know, you take the Laplace transform, Z is real, you look at the positive Z, and you look at the derivative you know, the next Z properties. So it's something that actually can be, can be explored both numerically and, and actually beyond that. Uh, and uh, so that's something which, if it did not satisfy that property, it wouldn't rule out the real hypothesis, but it would show that it could not be obtained this way. Because if it's obtained this way, it also has to have this other property. But it turns out to have the other property. Uh, so, but anyway, that, that, was, that was a similar question where there, there was a possible strategy. I, I don't know. Uh, 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 yeah, but I, uh, other than that, I don't have a very good answer. No, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah,